Can I lose my salvation? That's a question that you have likely asked yourself, I would guess. That's a question those you know have likely asked themselves. And it's an important question for us to consider today as we look at Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. If you've got a Bible, grab it, open it, get open to Romans 8. We're going to look at just those few verses. But before we get there, I need you to hear this. If your final salvation from sin, death, and the wrath of God ultimately depends on you, what you believe or don't believe, what you do or don't do, what you think or don't think, if your salvation ultimately depends on you, who knows? Who knows if you can or cannot lose your salvation? If your clinging to Jesus is the ultimate reason that you will be accepted by God the Father on the, on the day of judgment, you will be counted righteous. Jesus' death does count for you and your sins are gone. If your ability to stay clinging to Jesus is the ultimate reason you'll be found acceptable, who knows? Who knows if you will, in the end, finally be saved, or if through suffering, through doubts, through your own flesh, who knows if you will maybe at some time stop clinging to Jesus. If that's the ultimate question, can I lose my salvation? Then the answer is most assuredly, Yes. Yes, you, you absolutely can. That's why John MacArthur, Johnny Mac, is contributed or attributed as saying, if I could lose my salvation, I would. And if you don't know that's true in your own heart, I don't think you're honest with yourself. If you don't ask it that way, if it ultimately depends on me, who knows? In the 1600s, in 1611, Guys who followed the teaching of Jacob Arminius in the country of Holland, some pastors came out and they produced what are, what's called the Remonstrance. Five articles that we now know as the five doctrines or five articles of Arminianism. And when it comes to this fifth one, perseverance of the saints, the endurance of the saints, endurance of Christians. Will Christians continue? Will those who have been saved Actually, can they lose their salvation is kind of the question. The Arminians' position, because the rest of their positions on the other points were man-centered, and it depended ultimately on man's self-determining free will. They get to this last point, can you lose your salvation? Or they ask it more like, are those who follow John Calvin right that if God saves you, he will keep you and they will persevere? When they answered that question, they said, we don't know. There's no way to know. They said the only way you can have assurance that you are saved and will be kept and will persevere, the Arminian position, they literally said the only way you can know is through special revelation. And what they mean by that is not biblical revelation. When special revelation, that theological term, means that God somehow outside of the Bible, maybe through a dream or a vision, appears to you and speaks to you in a way to communicate something more than what's in the Word. So they said the only way you can have assurance of your salvation is if God gives it to you somehow through special revelation. Through, we would say something like how Jesus encountered Paul on the Damascus Road. That's special revelation. Jesus just shows up, knocks him off his horse. The Arminian position says exactly what I just said to you. And if you don't believe me or think I'm mis misquoting them, go and read. Go and read those articles. You can find them all. You can find the remonstrance online very easily. Go read the Calvinistic ref refuting of those errors in the articles of the Synod of Dort. Fantastic stuff to read. 
If the question is, can I lose my salvation? Friends, the answer is yes. But truth be told, that's a terrible question. The question that the Scripture brings us to, the, the question that the Scriptures are concerned with, is not, can I lose my salvation? The question is, can God or will God lose a Christian? You ever think that? Hear people talk about that? Graciously, lovingly, you could say, someone said, do you think a Christian can lose their salvation? Be tender, gracious, kind. Say, I think the real question is, will God lose a Christian? Not even can. God can do whatever he wants. The question is, will he? Will he lose someone who he has saved? And to answer that question, we turn to Romans 8, 28 through 30. Read it with me. Will God lose a Christian? This is the word of the Lord. Paul's writing to these people. He's getting to the end of Romans 8. This is right before the big crescendo. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The beginning of chapter 8 is, therefore, There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Just a gold mine of verses, a gold mine of promises. And then he gets to Romans 8, verse 28, and he says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Not all things are good, but all things work together for good. Not some things work together for good, all. He means what he says, all. For those who love God, meaning Christians, those whom God has saved, all things work together for good. For those who there's, here's how we specifically know he's talking about believers, about those whom God has saved. For those who are called according to his purpose. This is not those who are, hey, come to me. Not that kind of call. This is an inward call. This is, the theological term is the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit. That's what theologians say. I mean, it's when God, in your heart, as you hear the gospel or, or read the gospel in some way, the information of the gospel is being communicated to you, and God, like when Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb, God says to you, like he said to me, Brett, come forth, and we come alive, and we trust Jesus. That, it's that calling. It's the cross is foolishness to some, it's a stumbling block to some, but to those who are called. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's that effectual calling by which God calls you from death to life. Those whom are called according to whose purpose? God's. All things work together for good. That's probably the sweetest greatest, most comforting promise in all of the Bible. It includes every part of redemption, and it, recruit, it includes every square inch of our life. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't matter your theological position, as an Arminian Calvinist, you know, if you're that, cessationist, continuationist, premillennial, postmillennial. If you don't know what those mean, go look them up. It's, you'll think it's fun doesn't matter your position, everybody loves Romans 8.28, right? Prosperity preachers that love Romans 8.28. What's the grounds for Romans 8.28? What's the first word in Romans 8.29? For. Because. You could translate it like that. Paul's saying that the grounds of all things work together for good is this. This is why all things work together for good, starting with verse 29. Are you with me? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Look at the word foreknew. There's two different schools, interpretations of, two basic ones, of what people try to say God is meaning there. The Arminian position is typically 
God foreknew, meaning he foresaw, he looked through the future and saw what we would do of our own self-determining free will. Therefore, he predestined us. Okay? That's the Arminian position. I would submit to you, I don't think that's what he's saying at all. I think he's saying foreknew, knew in the sense of not I knew what they would do, but knew in the sense of for I know you. Beforehand, I set out to know you. I've embraced you. Just as early on in the Bible it says Adam knew his wife Eve. What's he talking about? He's talking about they really got to know each other? Well, you could say it like that, but you know what he's talking about. Because Cain was conceived through, Cain and Abel were conceived through that knowing. No, for new in this sense, you could say for embraced, for loved. And the context is key to why we say it's not, Paul's not just talking about God knew what would happen, therefore he predestined people. No, God forechose. The reason we know that, you can go a few verses later and see in verses 33 and 34 that he starts specifically talking about the elect, the chosen. The Greek word is eklegomai, those whom God has selected. So the context of the whole passage is, you could say, those whom he forechose, those whom he foreloved, those who he foreknew. Are you with me? not simply a knowledge about what would happen, is really God doesn't learn anything. He declares through the prophets, I know the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. I don't learn, he's saying, I don't learn anything. So the very idea that God would look in the future and see what we would do, like it would somehow him be learning something, that's a little problematic. But the context of it is foreloved, foreknew, forechose, the cross references, who will bring any charge against God's elect? Look a few verses later. It's exactly what he says. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. These are biblical words. We can't avoid them. We should embrace them. He predestined. And Calvinists, I think, can... They can miss the point sometimes of what the point is, what Paul's actually saying. It's not just so we would go, predestination. What's the point of predestination? What does he say predestined to? Pre, before. Destined, destiny, or determined. What to? What's the point? And look what he says. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Oh, that is sweet. God chose a people for himself before the foundation of the world, predetermining, predestinating, the old translations say, them, that he would make them like Jesus, the God-man who came to the earth and is the perfect represent representation of humanity. Our predestination is not just predestined to be in heaven. Though, sure, that's true. It's predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus, to be for God to make us like his perfect son, Jesus. Theologians have often called these verses the golden chain of redemption. Because Paul says, if God foreknew you, he predestined you. If he predestined you, look at the next verses. Or in fact, to finish out verse 29, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Does this mean Jesus is created? No. He's saying he's the heir of all things, and we, through faith in him, are then connected to him, and he's the firstborn of the family, but we get to share in that firstborn inheritance. He's the firstborn, but among many brothers, meaning all Christians. And we would end up being like him because God would totally change us in the end. Look at verse 30, how he links everything. Foreknew, predestined, verse 30, and those whom he predestined, so he picks back up to make sure we don't forget. I said predestined. 
I'm saying it again. Those whom he predestined, he also called. He's already said that just in a verse previous. We looked at 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31 to get a, a good idea of what it means when God calls someone. We see, if he predestined you, he also called. This is the calling from death to life. Regeneration. New birth. 2 Corinthians 4 says it's like we're blind and God shines light in our darkness. And we see Jesus. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, Paul says in Ephesians 2. But God, rich in mercy, with the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. That's that calling. God calls someone from death to life. Those whom he called, he also justified. You see how the chain? It keeps repeating and then building and saying, if you've been foreknown, you've been predestined. If you've been predestined, God will call you. If God calls you, he will justify you. There are none that are called that aren't justified. Do you see that? He's not saying some. Those. Those whom he called he also justified. It means, to be justified means to be declared righteous. Despite the fact that you don't deserve to be declared righteous. It's not just being declared innocent or not guilty. It's more than that. It's like you go into a courtroom and you've committed the heinous crimes. And not only do, does the judge end up declaring you not guilty, but he gives you a medal. You're credited with doing good, when in fact all you've done is bad. That's what it means to be justified by God, because Jesus, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, he lived for our righteousness, so that through faith in him, we would be counted righteous as he is righteous. His work would be credited to our account. It would count for us. And on the cross, he took our sin on himself. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. 1 Peter 2, 24. So that, through faith in him, our sin would be taken away. And God would not only declare us in his courtroom, as it were, not guilty, but also, also righteous. So it means to be justified. If God looks at you and says, justified, he stamped it down. If he calls you, he will justify you. Meaning, those whom he calls will come to faith in him because one of the clearest teachings in all of the Bible is that we are justified not through our works, but through faith in Jesus. That's how God declares us righteous, through faith in Jesus and what he's done. And those whom he justified, look at the end of verse 30, those whom he justified, he also glorified. Glorification is something that has not happened to any of us yet. At the time that Paul wrote this letter to these people in Rome, it had not happened to them. Glorification is what God will do in the end, make us glorious, give us new resurrected bodies, purge all sin from us, wipe away all tears, no more sorrow, no more sickness. Well, Paul speaks of it. Look, it's not a mistranslation for the, for the translators to put what Paul wrote in the Greek into the past tense. And the best consensus of commentators is that it is so sure a thing that if God has foreknown you, predestined, called, justified, the fact that you will be glorified one day is such a sure thing that Paul speaks about it in the past tense, like it's already done. Even though subjectively in our lives it hasn't happened yet, but Paul's saying, it's done. It's going to happen. Here's this golden chain of redemption. If he, if he chose, he predestined. If he predestined, he called. If he called, he justified. And if he justified, he will glorify. So when we come to this passage and ask the question, can I lose my salvation? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, does it? 
But if you ask the question, will, not can, will God lose a Christian? The answer seems to be, he's, he's not losing anything. From foreknew all the way to glorified. Friends, here are the real questions. Will God leave as an orphan any that he foreknew, any that he chose before the foundation of the world? No. He has set his love on them, and nothing will change from him doing them only good. All things work together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Will God give up to sin and idolatry any that he predetermined, any that he predestined to make like his perfect son, Jesus? No. If he predestined you, it's predestination to the conformity of his son. He will make us like Jesus, holy, bright, shining like the sun, something we can't even fathom. Will God cast out any that he has effectually called from death to life? Any that he has given the gift of faith? Will God ever throw someone out that he has called back from the dead? No. The Lord Jesus himself even says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And all who come to me, I will never cast out. Will God condemn any that he has already declared righteous? Will God declare you righteous on account of what Jesus has done for you, but then later, sometime, bring you back into the courtroom and say, yeah, unrighteous? If it's God's work to justify us, and he declares us righteous, not on account of our works, but on account of Jesus' works, Jesus' works are done! He lived without sin, he died for sin, he arose for salvation, he ascended to the right hand of God where he sits and waits until his enemies become a footstool for his feet. Will the Father ever look at someone that he justified on account of Jesus and say, nah, I changed my mind? It's as if to say, well, we didn't do anything to earn our salvation, but we can do something to unearn it. But if our salvation is not based on our earning or unearning, how, how could that ever be? Will God condemn anyone he's declared righteous? No. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you have died. What does Paul mean when he says that? For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I think he means something like, you can't be dragged back into the courtroom of God and declared unrighteous any more than a corpse could be drugged back into a courtroom in our day and convicted of a crime. They're dead. You don't convict dead people of crimes. And he's saying, you've died. Your life, now, your life... You died, your life is now hidden with Christ and God. So the real question kind of becomes, rather than will God bring you back and declare you unrighteous, the real question is, if our life is hidden in Christ, will God the Father bring Jesus into his courtroom and declare Jesus unrighteous, deserving of hell? You go, absolutely not. <coughs> If our life is hidden with Christ and God, none whom he has declared righteous on account of Jesus will ever be condemned. No. Friends, this is the sweetness of the gospel. Listen to me. If you come to Jesus through faith, if your faith is in him, or if you would come to him, he will receive you. And you'll enter through this doorway, this doorway that says, Whosoever will may come. If you walk through that trusting, embracing Jesus, you'll get to the other side of that door and look at the top and see chosen before the foundation of the world. 
If you go through that door, through faith in Jesus, if you trust him, you can know that God has called you because he predestined you, because he foreknew you. And if God has called you, if he's justified you through faith in Jesus, he will glorify you. You will keep going. But there are common questions that come with this doctrine. There are passages of Scripture that seem could be saying the opposite. So I want to answer a couple of common questions as we finish today. The first one is, if those whom he called, he justified, and he glorified, what this happening between being what we would just call being saved, being justified. We trust Jesus. We're baptized. You know, God saves us. And then we're supposed to, everyone that, that happens to will be glorified. About this in-between sanctification, growth in Christ. What about those people who trusted Jesus, followed Jesus, and then at some time in their life walked away from Jesus? Didn't keep trusting him. Didn't keep striving to obey him. That's often the argument. It's like, no, you're saying people can't lose their salvation or God won't lose a Christian. People have said to me personally, good friends of mine have said, I've seen it happen. You guys who are in ministry, who love the Lord, who preach with energy and passion, and then they end up walking away from Jesus and they don't trust him anymore and they don't obey him anymore. And they're clearly not a Christian. What do you do with that? 1 John 2.19 is incredibly helpful. You need one verse. The Apostle John deals with that same thing. What about those who seem to be Christians and then walk away? John's answer is, they weren't justified to begin with. He says it like this. They went out from us, 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, so that it might become plain that they all are not of us. It seems like a problem. It's like, well, my experience shows that you can be saved and you know, walk away. John says, if you walk away, it's that it wasn't ever real. He says, for if they were of us, meaning if, to use his language in this letter, we studied through this letter earlier this year, I bet you remember. If they have fellowship with Jesus, by having fellowship with the message of the apostles, the gospel, that's what he means by us. If they really were of us, if they really had faith in Jesus, they would have continued. And not only that, he says, but they went out to make plain that they aren't of us, that they really weren't in Christ. What about those who profess faith and walk away from him? This doesn't mean... You, having periods of sin, having periods when you're, you're in ruts, you're in darkness, that you stray off a bit, or that, to use the prophet Isaiah's term, you backslide. It's a biblical word. It doesn't mean that if you go through those seasons of doubt or just living like a dummy, it doesn't mean you're necessarily not in Christ. But if you continue in that, you're revealing that you're not. Because if you are in Christ, you, God will not let you keep going. He will bring you back. He's the good shepherd that will discipline you for your holiness. So don't fear and think, I've had seasons of doubt. I've had, I don't know. Is your faith in Jesus today? Continue. Take that as a warning, too. You go out, you're making plain that you're not of Him. You abandon Him, you quit believing in Him, quit striving to obey Him, you're not in Christ. I think God uses those warnings. Second question, when it comes to perseverance or having security in our salvation, I, I think these are the two most common. There's probably more, and if there are, text them in. be happy to try and answer them. Does this doctrine, once saved, always saved, if saved, always saved, does this doctrine mean we can live however we want since salvation is all of grace? No. 
For the same God who justifies freely and will glorify in between the justification and glorification is something called sanctification, meaning being set apart, growing in Christ, you could say, abiding in Christ, enduring in the faith. All words the scripture uses to communicate the same thing. The same God who freely justifies also by grace sanctifies us. And he even disciplines those who are straying, not punishes, disciplines to wound us and wake us up. Hebrews 12. The same God who saves also changes. He says to everyone, come as you are. But he loves us enough that he will not leave us as we are. If you think perseverance of the saints, security, knowing that those whom he called justified, glorified, means I can live lax and live any way I want, you don't have the first idea about the doctrine. We must, number one, we must persevere in faith. Keep clinging to Jesus. We must. Colossians 1, 21 through 23. I want you to... I'm, Two verses I'm going to quote to you, and I want you to notice the ifs Paul uses. Okay? Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And you, he's speaking to Christians, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If, indeed, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. If you continue to believe. You see that? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. There, there are other if passages, but suffice it to say this, if you stop trusting Jesus, you will not be saved in the end. We must persevere in faith. How are you going to do that? 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Blessed be God. Praise be to God. He's caused us to be born again. We have an imperishable hope. We have an inheritance kept in heaven for us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. It's not. If you have faith, God will guard you. In this way, Paul flips it around and says, by God's power, we're being guarded through faith. That means, Christian, you woke up this morning trusting Jesus because God is guarding you through faith. He's sustaining your faith. That's why I know personally some of you have wondered, and I mean wonder is like, wow, of how you're still a Christian. I know some of you see things in the scripture that sit really wrongly with your heart, that cause you turmoil, frustration. Now, some of you have suffered in serious ways. Some of you have doubted. Some of you have pierced yourself with many pangs through your own foolishness. And I know you think, how am I still believing in Jesus? How have I not turned away from him? If you haven't ever thought that, you should think, why did I wake up this morning still believing in Jesus? I think Peter's answer here in 1 Peter 1 is, by God's power, you are being guarded through faith 
for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We must persevere in faith. We also must persevere in obedience. Hebrews 12, 14. Don't miss this. If you continue in the faith, if you continue trusting, if you continue to hold fast to the word I preach to you, there are ifs, and God fulfills the ifs in his people. Isn't that wonderful? He will keep us believing. We must obey. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you don't understand the gospel, if you don't understand God keeping and preserving his people, if you don't understand those whom he justified, he will glorify, then you're going to read those passages and just go straight to your flesh, straight to pride, straight to your own, I can do it, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, or if you're honest enough, you'll just give up. Because he says, strive for peace and unity and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The writer of Hebrews is saying, you don't strive for holiness, you ain't going to see Jesus. That's a gulp. Hmm? I thought it was based on grace. Absolutely it is. And the grace that saves changes. You profess faith in Jesus, you don't strive. I'm not talking about you're perfect. You guys know me. You know, I fall hundreds of miles short of what I preach every week. I fall miles short of what I'm telling you we should do. I preach much higher holiness than I live. I think we would all agree with that. I'm not talking about perfect obedience. I'm talking about striving after it. Desiring righteousness. Seeking to put your sin to death. To take advantage of corporate worship and community groups and Bible study on your own and with your family and all of the means that God uses to sanctify us. You're not imploring, employing those in your life. You're not seeking after holiness. You're not seeking to put your sin to death. Holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You don't strive after holiness, you won't see Jesus. You'll go to hell. Mark 13, 13. Jesus says, You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures till the end will be saved. You don't endure to the end, you will not be saved in the judgment. You will reveal that you were not justified. You were not called. You were not predestined. You were not foreknown. You will not be glorified. God uses these warnings to wake his people up and show that if he saves you, he's going to sanctify you and change you, and you're going to keep believing because he's going to keep you believing. You're going to keep striving after holiness. How are we going to do that? Jude 1, 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Oh, but he's not only able. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 23 seems like Paul's like, oh, this is my desire for you. May the God of peace sanctify you completely, keep you blameless for the day of Jesus Christ. It just seems like a really good hope, prayer. And then verse 24 he who calls you, calls, effectually calls. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Just when it seems like, I hope it's going to happen, he says, he's going to do it. He will surely do it. If Paul was sure about something, 
I think we can be sure about it. If one who is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen the Word of God for us, if he is sure, that means God is sure. He will surely do it. Philippians 1.6, the shortest of all these. Whew, you need to memorize these verses. He will surely do it. He's able to keep me from stumbling. Philippians 1.6, I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Do not, do not only look at passages that say salvation is all of grace and then ignore passages that say, you don't keep believing, you won't be saved. You don't keep striving after holiness, you won't be saved. Don't, we can't dare do that. It's both. But God meets the qualifications in his people because he works in us and through us. He's given us God the Holy Spirit. He will change us. It will be imperfect. We will constantly be humbled because we fall so short. But our aim will be high. And God will sustain us in faith. We must persevere in believing. Praise God that he keeps us believing, guarding us through faith. We must keep obeying. Praise God that he's not only able to keep us from stumbling, but he will surely do it. This is why in the 1600s, in 1617 and 18, many pastors came together from all over Europe and they had the Synod of Dort. And they together wrote, over a two-year span, the Canons of Dort, which is what we now know as what we call the five points of Calvinism or the doctrines of grace. This is why perseverance of the saints is a theological term. This is why it is very unhelpful to ask the question, can I lose my salvation? It's why it's very unhelpful to phrase it in the way, once saved, always saved. That's unhelpful. I've been to countless funerals that the one officiating the funeral says something to the effect of, well, I know they did not live they weren't a part of the church. They, they did some bad stuff. They didn't, they're basically saying they didn't seem at all like a Christian. Didn't trust, didn't seem to trust him, didn't seem to obey him at all, didn't seem to give a rip. And they said, but I know they're in heaven because I know on October 29th, 1972, they prayed and asked Jesus into their heart. So I know they're in heaven. Holiness without which no one will see the Lord. It is not about, I prayed and asked Jesus in the heart. It's done. If you did, if you truly have come to faith in Jesus, it's because God called you and he will sanctify you. And you will seek to be sanctified at the same time. We must persevere. Perseverance of the saints is the way that I, I think is most helpful to put it. Because it says, God's saints that he saved will persevere. Because God will keep working in them. And so I say to you this verse. It may seem to you like, wait, is it God doing it or is it us doing it? Yes. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and and trembling, says Paul in Philippians 2. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's where we live. He will do it, but you will not be passive in it. You will strive after holiness. You will keep believing in Jesus, knowing that God is going to sustain you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You don't have fear and trembling over your sin. Check your heart. Look to the cross. How dare we make peace with that which brought our king to death. Work it out. Keep trusting. Keep obeying. Keep crucifying the flesh, your sin, 
and know that it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Friends, the truth of the gospel is that we are not captains of our own destiny. You have a much better captain than you. We have a captain that says, I chose you. You did not choose me. We have a captain who says, I will never cast you out. We have a captain who says, I laid down my life for the sheep. I will raise them up on the last day. Our hope, our assurance is not in our ability to stay tightly gripping to Jesus. Our hope and assurance is the fact that Jesus says, no one can take you out of my hand. We are not in Christ ultimately through our determination, but through him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So praise God for that. Can you lose your salvation? Yes. Will God lose a Christian? No. Who are you going to trust? Yourself or Jesus? I implore you, run away from yourself. Run away from anything you think you can stand on. Run away from any worldly wisdom. Run away from anything that would keep you from looking at Jesus and what he did, especially on the cross, and saying, that's the wisdom of God, and that's the power of God. Embrace him. He'll never cast you out. Pray with me. Father, thank you that you will work in us to keep us persevering, keep us enduring. Thank you for the gift of faith. Thank you that you are guarding us through faith. Thank you that you will surely do it. Help us to boast in you alone. And help us to work our tails off at continuing to trust and continue, continuing to strive after holiness, knowing that you're working in us. We ask you to save and sanctify. We cannot do it. Please make us more like Jesus. We cling to that promise that you've predestined us to be conformed to the image of your Son. Help us to delight in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.